two, one. Good afternoon and welcome to everyone in attendance today. My name is Ann Cabrera and I will be moderating this installment of Tetra Tech's COVID-19 live event webinar series. Today's topic is COVID-19 safe buildings. As we get started, you can send troubleshooting questions using the Q&A tab in the upper right hand portion of your screen. Hopefully we can address most technical questions early on through that tab. We will also collect questions you ask about today's content. You can populate the Q&A tab throughout the presentation. We anticipate a lot of questions on this timely topic, so please remember to include your name and email so we can get back to you directly after the presentation. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today, Douglas Mass and Steven Strauss. Doug is the president of Cosentini internationally recognized in the design and construction industry because of his expertise as a mechanical engineer, his commitment to design innovation, and a long list of high performance building projects designed by leading architects. Steven Strauss is the president of Glumac, a sustainability focused building engineering and commissioning firm founded in 1971. Since 2000, Stephen has grown the firm threefold while holding true to its mission to design green buildings that work. With sustainable design as its guide, Glumac has become a leader in the green building industry, having hundreds of LEED certified projects in its portfolio. Both Cosentini and Glumac are part of the TetraTech High Performance Buildings Group. I'll turn it over to you, Doug and Steve. Thank you, Anne, and good afternoon, everybody. First, I'd like to introduce the Tetra Tech High Performance Building Group. We have over 2,500 uh, design, building design experts uh, in over 30 offices worldwide representing four continents. And this presentation is really based on best practices, not from any particular region of the country, but best practices that we've gathered uh, from our offices throughout the world. Equally important, when we listen to Dr. Fauci, which we all listen to him on, on television, he's always talking about leading with science. And we brought on onto our commission or our panel, our task force, some of the world's leading experts that can work with us. First is Dr. Bill Bonfleck, who is the chairman of the ASHRAE COVID-19 task force, a professor at Penn State and a leading expert in mitigation of viruses. In addition, we have Dr. Michael Kaiser, who is an infectious disease physician who has been very um, uh, involved with the HIV virus. So we brought together uh, a lot of resources, which is how we put together this, this presentation. We put this disclaimer in because every day each of us is learning new things about the virus, how it spreads, how to mitigate it. So what we're presenting today is based on the best information we have as of the first day of July. I specifically remember when Edwin called me from Shanghai on the first day of the quarantine there. He noted that the streets were completely empty and that it was actually scary. In China today, everybody has a QR code on their phone and it's green when they're available to enter buildings and facilities. It turns yellow if they may have had contact with somebody, and it turns red, meaning you have to be quarantined. Everyone in Asia wears face masks continuously. In our Shanghai office, people wear face masks every day, and they've been back to work for several months now. And it's even risen to a level of fashion where people have face mask and shield. We know when people return to the office, they're going to have a heightened awareness of the risk of the infectious disease, and it's our responsibility to help mitigate that risk. So we put together this four step process to help mitigate the spread of the virus. Wanted to start with the science of the virus itself. 
the virus particle is extremely small. It's 0.06 to 0.14 microns. And to put that in perspective, your hair is 80 microns in diameter. It's an extremely small particle. And as such, couldn't necessarily be captured even by HEPA filters. But the particles that we're concerned about are the particles that are coagulated with moisture and protein that are infected. They tend to be in the 0.3 micron range and they can be captured by filtration. We know that the primary transfer has been through large droplets, but Dr. Kaiser advised me that they don't exactly know how the virus is transferred. There's still more work to be done. You saw how the CDC's recommendations recently changed on the risk of contaminated surfaces. Much of our discussion today is going to be about lingering clouds or aerosolized virus. We know that just inhaling one virus particle is very unlikely to give you the disease COVID-19. Based on previous respiratory diseases, they believe it's about a thousand particles. What's important for this discussion is you can get that by one breath, or you could get that by a thousand breaths of one particle each over a long period of time. And this illuminates the risk that's associated. So if you're on a 30 second or one minute elevator ride, there's a much lower chance of accumulating those particles than if you're in an office space with a low level and you're there all day. We know that the majority of cases that have been tracked have occurred indoors, many times with poor ventilation. We know that often it's contracted and bought home, but it's also a potential in the workplace. And as more people return to the work, we're concerned about mitigating it. operational recommendations. It's very important that we keep our buildings as safe as possible. And one of the ways to do that is through screening. This is a uh, an image of a FLIR temperature sensor. And even though we know that, uh, or they believe that the pre-symptomatic folks are, are spreading at least, well, they say 40% of the virus today, uh, as people start developing a fever, we're seeing more and more thermal cameras in buildings to make sure that if you have a fever that you can't come in. Occupancy monitoring, contact tracing. Today, through your apps, through Bluetooth, you can actually track who is in the building and if two people are within a certain distance of each other, you can get an alert and we can keep people safe that way, as Steve alluded to what they're doing in China already, but this technology is available. Increased, increased cleaning strategies. In the buildings that we occupy today, we need to make sure the surfaces are clean. For example, deep cleaning strategies, there will be people that will contract the virus and if they do and they notify the building, the building needs to do some type of deep cleaning at night, maybe a fogging system in there to keep surfaces clean. Uh, we do know that buildings that have not been occupied, that, are, that, that have been vacant for uh, several months, we need to flush the pipes to make sure the domestic water is fresh, et cetera. Packages. Although the CDC is now saying it, it is less likely you'll contract the illness from touching a package, we still need to keep the packages sterilized and clean. What will buildings be doing in the future? Will, will we have quarantining packages? Will we have UV sterilization? Something to be determined. Common touch points clearly needs to be cleaned on a regular basis. And lease terms. It's important that, that tenants have the security to know that the cleaning companies will keep the common areas clean in buildings. This is an illustration of a fogging system, very common that's been used in buildings today to keep the surfaces clean using an EPA approved material. 
social behaviors, and this is, I think, the most important thing we, we need to consider. How do we keep people safe and what do building occupants do? We need to strongly encourage face masks whenever people are in buildings. We need to design buildings to encourage physical distancing so people will not be closer than six feet. Education, education, education. People need to understand that they need to wash their hands, they, they need to understand how they move within the space. And of course, new protocols, which we're all seeing about cleaning, circulating in spaces, and of course, elevators to minimize the number of people in an elevator at one time. We have simple and straightforward HVAC recommendations. ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, has indicated that while there's no evidence that the virus has gone through the HVAC system to other parts of the building infected people, there is evidence that the HVAC system has pushed the virus particles within the space and has infected people. And we just received a report last Sunday from Oregon Health Sciences University where they did measure COVID at three air handling units in a hospital that had 80% outside air and they, they 25% of the samples were positive, including downstream of the high efficiency MERV 15 filter. Next. Increased outdoor air ventilation is the recommendation of ASHRAE of the European equivalent of Tetra Tech. We recommend increasing the amount of outside air if you have a building with minimum outside air, we recommend disabling the demand ventilation control systems to provide extra outside air. Extending the hours of operation, especially if the building has minimum outside air. And we know that underfloor air distribution systems offer the opportunity for removing the particles more effectively from the space. We'll review the different filter options. And in as far as recirculation is concerned, we're not recommending increased air recirculation. Often we're recommending reduced air recirculation to minimize spreading the virus particles around the space. We do recommend increased bathroom exhaust where there's high potential for transfer and where you can accommodate more outside air, including operable windows, these should be utilized. Doug will talk more about humidity control, but there is evidence that the virus thrives in humidities below 40%. And we're concerned about this fall and this winter in northern climates. These are the types of air filtration systems that are available. While the HEPA filter is the only filter that can capture these small virus particles, we're primarily concerned with the particles that have moisture and proteins. And these tend to be slightly larger, 0.3 microns. They can be effectively captured by commercially available MER 14 filters. It's not easily able to change out air handling systems to accommodate the large pressure drop of HEPA filters. You can see by this chart that the lower level filters are not very effective in the one to three micron size, but when you get to MERV 13 up through MERV 15, these filters are very efficient and very effective and are recommended. Carbon filters. Carbon filters we're showing because people are asking us about them, but they're basically uh, installed in systems for odor control, not for uh, a viral reduction. Bipolar ionization. Bipolar ionization has become very popular and essentially what it does, it takes moisture particles, it will break them into positive and negative ions that are in the air within a building what they do is they attract smaller particles and they will clump together and fall out of the atmosphere. Uh, there's also uh, 
some research that says that they will attach themselves to the small viral particles and can disable the viruses on surfaces. ASHRAE's position is there has not been any rigorous testing to date or independent peer review. So for as of now, we see this as a, uh, as a, a potential for improving air quality from a, an allergy standpoint, but there's been no long-term studies on health effects, uh, nor on their effects on, on the virus. They can be used in, in advance of the filter, so they would clump the particles together that might get caught in the filter, or oftentimes they're used within the space themselves. Ozone generators we're showing because again, we're getting questions about that. And while it's very effective, it is not a very safe um, method uh, in, and we do not recommend ozone within spaces where people are. We do recommend certain ultraviolet systems. Ultraviolet light is a proven technology, first utilized in 1877. And the 1940s, ultraviolet lighting was used throughout hospitals in the United States until they began using uh, medications to mitigate the spread. The 254 to 265 nanometer wavelength of ultraviolet light is proven to be the most effective at killing viruses. If you look directly at that wavelength of light, it won't blind you, but you will have a severe headache and what can also cause skin irritation. Ultraviolet light's been used in HVAC systems for years. And while it is effective in killing the moss and biocide that grows on cooling coils, it isn't effective in killing the virus particles. There's not enough residence time for the air to be ionized by the ultraviolet light. The air is just moving too fast through the system. They've tried to install UV lights and longer duck runs to get more residence time, but it's just not enough to be effective to certainly kill the virus. Upper level ultraviolet lighting systems, however, are very effective at killing the virus. They rely on mixed mode ventilation, meaning that the air is circulating around in the space and the UV lighting that's directed at the ceiling has a radiation level that effectively kills the virus as it travels through that upper portion of the room. This technology can be very effective and could be applied in dental offices and conference rooms and retail spaces. The light fixtures are moderately priced and so are the bulbs and this technology is readily available. The device on the left is a robotic ultraviolet disinfecting system. They're $96,000 each. It's a Danish company that makes them. We know that the Chinese government has already purchased 1,350 of these. We have tech clients that are also testing them out in their office operation. There is new technology in the 200 to 230 nanometer wavelength spectrum. This is proposed as being safe for people and effective at killing the virus. Unfortunately, unfortunately there's inadequate third party testing to ensure this product is safe for the use and there's not enough information that it's effectiveness on killing the virus. So we're only recommending this in specific applications. Some of our clients are using them in restrooms where people spend only a short period of the day. So as we return to work, as we return to stores, as we regain normalcy in our lives, we have to talk about touchless technology. How do we want to live and work in buildings? So we're going to discuss doors and entryways, pantries, bathrooms, and lighting controls. Let's think about the journey when we go to work, we go to a building. 
we'd like to have some type of automatic door that we don't need to touch. You walk in, perhaps an entryway mat with some disinfection on it for your shoes, a sanitation station at the entry uh, to disinfect your hands, some type of plexi plexiglass barrier or, or a barrier from you to the security or reception person. Then we go through the turnstile, and again, that becomes a little more uh, interesting because how do we get through the turnstile? Are we gonna have to touch our card to the turnstile? Well, there's technologies like facial recognition and mask recognition today, as well as thermal scanning, uh, which would prevent you from, from coming in. But we believe in a touch-free touch -free security system, perhaps with your app or some kind of, of sensor. Also, we want to make sure the lobbies of our buildings have increased outside air and, and better air treatment as Steve discussed. Now you're in the elevator lobby, uh, minimize the eleva elevator occupancy we mentioned. And again, a touchless destination dispatch elevator system, either optically or through your mobile app. Now you get up to your office floor. We have uh, better air treatment in the system, as we discussed earlier. Larger separated workstations, staggering work hours, uh, occupying every other desk perhaps for social distancing. For small rooms like conference rooms, what we found is that by putting in a portable air filtration system, it's a system with a HEPA filter, which will not only clean the air, but will give a, a frankly, a psychological benefit to people in those rooms, because many of the, the buildings today do not have adequate ventilation in small rooms. Additionally, we're talking about adding CO2 sensors, carbon dioxide sensors that will, for systems that do have dedicated outside air systems, which will allow more outside air to be brought in, should the CO2 levels go, go up in the space. We're gonna need floor markings for circulation and separation and desk dividers for existing desks where you want people to be socially separated. So now we're at work and we need to go to the pantry. Education is very important. Hand washing education posters. We're recommending app based coffee machines and automatic water bottle fillers so you don't need to touch the, uh, the device. And something as simple as having our automatic faucets with a 20 second timer. So whether you're washing your hands or you're cleaning something, the water stays on for 20 seconds. And we know because of social pressures, if you walk away and the water is still flowing, your, your friends are gonna say, please continue washing your hands. Something as simple as countertop cutouts for touchless waste and recycling systems are important. Bathrooms. Uh, there is evidence that uh, aerosolization of fecal matter uh, will uh, uh, provide some type of, uh, of viral um, uh, uh, effluent into, into the air. However, there's no evidence that people have really gotten ill from that. Nonetheless, we feel it's very important to have increased bathroom exhaust, have more air changes in the bathroom. We're also looking into full height uh, water closet partitions with additional exhaust in there to keep them separated. Uh, UV, Disinfection for toilet seats is very common over in Asia, not yet in the US. And what Steve discussed before is using UV lights for after hours disinfection, whether it's a far UV or a UVC light, which will, will go on and off based on occupancy. Automatic bathroom doors that you don't need to touch. I mentioned the 20 second faucet. And if there's a floor drain in bathrooms, especially if they haven't been occupied, let's get some primers in there to make sure that we don't get any sewer gases into the space. And LEED and WELL, we've been designing LEED projects uh, for the last 20 years and LEED projects and now WELL projects are well suited to mitigate the spread of the virus, as you can see from some of the attributes that are listed here. So in summary, we have some basic recommendations for buildings. First is outside air. And as Steve mentioned, this talked about dilution, 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 and increasing outside air will dilute contaminants and operate it continuously. In fact, prior to occupancy and after occupancy, we recommend that the system be run at least a couple of hours on the shoulders. 
restrooms, increasing bathroom exhaust, check the, pra the, tra uh, the trap climbers, and we mentioned considering UV sterilization. Humidity control, adding humidification where you can. Many buildings can't support due to their facades, but 40 to 60% is the maximum level for, for health. Local filtration I mentioned in conference rooms, small spaces, HEPA filters, or even ionization in dense locations. And of course, touchless world, the world of touchless technologies. Well, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Today's July 1st. It's the first day that the state of Oregon is requiring mandatory face masks. Tetra Tech is a science-based company. And as such, we're strongly recommending that you wear face masks whenever you're in an indoor public situation and outdoors where you can be close to people. With that, we'll open it up for questions. Is that right? Or what's the next step here? Actually, we're almost at the half hour. So I think if anybody has any questions, if they could use the Q&A function to put those in the Q&A, um, and then we will make sure if you put your name and your email address that we will follow up um, via email with answers to those questions. Um, I wanna offer a sincere thanks to both our presenters for their insights today. For attendees, this presentation and previous COVID-19 webinars can be found at Tetra Tech's COVID-19 webpage. Our next webinar will be held on Wednesday, July 15th, beginning at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. The topic will be the use of AI-powered chatbot Auxilium to assist in the COVID-19 response. As registered attendees for today's webinar, you will automatically receive an invitation to future webinars. Thank you again for attending today's event.